and welcome everyone to this show. You're watching Believe. You can find us usually at believe.love, youtube.com slash believe loves you. For our Apple users, believe itunes.com and Android, believe android.com. Thanks again, I'm Vanessa, and we'll be discussing today just a few different topics. Um, let's jump right into it. For money and business, we're going to be discussing some pretty cool stuff here. Um, <clears throat> Basically, how optimism influences um, your entrepreneurship. How can we become better entrepreneurs? How, do we, how can we also remain more optimistic? And does any of that, any of that really matter? <laughs> Is that even important? Do you have to be um, optimistic to even be an entrepreneur, to be an entrepreneur, or to be successful as an entrepreneur? We were doing some research on it. And of course, luck may have it, researchers, I'm sorry, experts would say that, yeah, optimism is definitely, definitely a huge thing for entrepreneurs. Actually, um, Daniel Con Kahneman, who won a Nobel Prize, he said something along the lines of a, cre a key trait of entrepreneurs is something called delusional optimism. He says that optimists are more likely to, to be successful. Um, and that totally makes sense. The power of positive thinking is so real. He would say something along the lines, or you know, if you, if you hear a statement like that, that optimists are more likely to be successful, it totally does make sense when you really, really think about it. The reason being, um, if every single time you jumped into a situation, you were already going through your mind and saying all the bad things, all the negative things, all the things that aren't gonna happen, you're only kind of, you know, setting yourself up for failure. Optimists, they think any idea, every idea that they do is a brilliant one. And they go after that idea like it's their only one. And that's, I think, what's really cool about being an entrepreneur and staying optimistic while doing so. Um, another thing, just, just touching on to that delusional optimism. He says that if you rationally weighed out the odds of success, you would never start a business. That also makes a lot of sense. There are a lot of pros and cons that go into making a successful business. And it's one thing just to get it off of the ground, but to keep it afloat as well, right? So we say stuff like, thank goodness for your rationality. Thank goodness that I was crazy enough to think that I could do this. Because then you actually, actually can. He believes that leaders, inventors, um, entrepreneurs, business owners, they all carry this similar trait of delusional optimism, of thinking that they can accomplish things that may always seem so crazy. And if anyone, if you were just to talk to anyone about them, they may look at you like you're crazy. But until you do it, you don't seem so crazy anymore, do you? Um, also, an article that was just recently published last week on entrepreneur.com, um, an article that says how to never let fear hold you back again. <clears throat> um, it goes into explain how fear is by far the biggest and main factor that stands between us and the best versions of ourselves. You know, it's our fear of failure, our fear of rejection. It's our fear that ultimately stops us from doing the things that we need to do. And the fear of failure of course, uh, surely taking the lead, like I just mentioned. He suggests that we entrepreneurs especially change our personal philosophy on what failure is. That makes, that makes so much sense, and it's eye-opening, right? Change the way your personal philosophy, change the way that you perceive failure. If every single time that you, you know, you started to view, if you, every single time you did something, and you didn't get the results that you were looking for, if you looked at that as a new way to learn, a new way to grow, a new way to, to basically rethink this whole situation rather than a failure or a mess up or you know whatever it is that you might categorize it as, you're constantly teaching yourself to better yourself. You're teaching yourself to one, not take no for an answer, to continuously push, 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 and you're teaching yourself how to be optimistic. That is. That's number one. 101, staying optimistic, is looking at every opportunity um, as an actual opportunity. Don't let 
little things discourage you from doing what you want to do. And this reminds me of a saying that I love. Um, I heard it when I was a lot younger and I've always, it's carried with me, I guess, it's, I've carried it with me um, <laughs> through my adulthood. And it's something along the lines of experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. So if we looked at every single situation, every single failure, as a situation where we are meant to gain experience or a situation where we're meant to learn something new, we really wouldn't perceive failure as such as such of a burden. We wouldn't perceive failure as such a negative and nasty thing. We would love it. We would be like, yes, I get to learn something new or great, this didn't work, so maybe this will work. You know, you'll just keep pushing yourself and you'll get in the habit of not quitting. You'll get in the habit of pushing through, which I think is awesome. And I'm really, really excited, you know, for many entrepreneurs um, that, that share these grateful tips so that we can pass them along to you. You know, stay open-minded, stay optimistic, and it's definitely a great way to succeed. Um, I thought I'd put together, you know, three helpful tips on how to stay optimistic for entrepreneurs. If maybe you're starting your own business, maybe you own a small business, and maybe, you know, you're just trying to figure out ways to keep things light, keep things you know, definitely on the right track. You want to stay productive. You want to stay, you know, efficient, but you also want to be optimistic. You also want to keep the right energy around you and of course the right people around you. So I would say your first tip to remain optimistic would be to focus on your solutions, not the problems. Focus on your solutions. If you find yourself obsessing over all the things that are going wrong, everything that's going wrong, then that, that could be one of your main issues. You're not looking at the situation. You're not seeing the full spectrum. You're not seeing the whole rainbow there. You're only seeing what it is that you think is there. And I feel like that's, that'll go a long way for anyone, even if you're not an entrepreneur, for any little thing in life, always focus on the solution. If we, I feel like as human beings, we get into the habit of complaining. We get into the habit of being upset and just weighing it down on ourselves, just reminding ourselves and staying in that same mental mindset. And when you're staying in that mindset of um, complaining, being negative, you're not going to see through. You're not going to see the light at the end of the tunnel, possibly. You're not going to be able to pull yourself out and remain productive or maybe go back to being productive. Replacing problem-focused thinking with solution-focused thinking. It's the foundation of optimism, for sure. And it'll definitely, definitely help you as you work towards being an entrepreneur. It'll help you stay in the right mindset, especially, because starting a business, being an entrepreneur, we're a little different than most people, right? Um, we see all the possibilities, but we can also, and that's the reason why we have to be the ones to also be able to take ourselves down. So by seeing everything, if we're letting ourselves be stuck on a negative situation, we may perceive that as being the only thing to see because we are so used to being the ones that see everything that people don't see. So I want to remind you to stay optimistic and definitely, definitely focus on the solutions. You'll begin to see failure as a new start. <laughs> Your next thing here, I would say, is practice persistence. Um, you know, it's like the art of being told no, and it's like we're, we're, we're told no, so what do we do next? Mostly, I feel, if you know, it's the most of us, if we were told no, we get discouraged. We run into a room, we cry, maybe, I don't know, your own personal thing, but I know that it's, I know that it's difficult, of course, for entrepreneurs um, to hear that word no. I know that that could be very difficult. And I feel the reason why that could be very difficult is because so often we associate no um, with never. We assume that this no is forever. And we don't take that as an opportunity, um, you know, among ourselves, don't take that as an opportunity to, to learn something, to learn something new, to make something new. So as an entrepreneur, Practicing the art of persistence will definitely take you a long way. It'll help you achieve your goals and it'll turn or it'll help you turn those no's into yeses. And I think the best way to, to think about that. Now, hold on, before I jump ahead, <laughs> you want to be persistent, but you don't want to be a nuance. You want to be able to stand your ground and let people know that you're serious, of course, even after hearing that no. But doing that without pushing them, getting them to do things that they don't want to do, or getting them, even worse, getting them to never want to work with you again. So you want to definitely pick your battles, and you want to understand every situation that you're jumping into. 
<clears throat> so when it comes to practicing persistence, I would definitely, definitely focus on, focus on, of course, when you hear that, no. Focus on yourself in those moments. I think when we hear that no, like I said, we hear never and we think that maybe, we just think that maybe the entire product is just not gonna work. We start maybe ripping everything up from the seams. And not that that mindset can't help you in the sense that there definitely is something that you do need to work on, but I think that you need to take that step back in that moment and really, really focus on yourself, your product, your presentation, everything else. And just think for a moment, what is it that I could have done better to get that yes? What is it that I could have done differently to get that yes? And maybe, you know, speak with that person. If, if it's one of those opportunities where you, you have flexibility and stuff like that, then talk to that person, sit down with them, go over your presentation, see what it was that didn't work out. What I'm saying though with this, with this, uh, this tip, number two of practice persistence, is definitely learn to not take no for an answer, but don't get discouraged by that no, and don't pressure that or push that no either. You want to find that even balance of always remaining true to yourself. So what's most important after you get that no? What's most important for your business, uh, for yourself as an entrepreneur? What's most important after you get that no is focusing on what it is that you did. Focusing on your presentation, your product, everything else, and seeing if you can figure out what it is that got you to receive that no. And see if there's a way that you can rework that for yourself to possibly get a yes. So I would say that that's number two. Practice persistence and, and keep on pushing for sure. Now number three, our last tip uh, for remaining optimistic as an entrepreneur would be to spread good vibes. This goes a long, long, long way. Optimism is very contagious and having an upbeat attitude totally goes a long way. If you don't believe me, a survey conducted by Gallup found that about 35% of U.S. managers are engaged in their jobs. This lack of engagement and its impact on employees cost the U.S. an estimated $77 billion to $96 billion each year. I'm not sure if you heard that. 35% of U.S. managers are engaged in their jobs. That's a really, really considerably low number. And it's definitely, definitely impacting, you know, the amount of money that we can be taking, that we can be, I guess, bringing in as a country. The employee cost of that lack of engagement is $77 billion to $96 billion a year. That's just crazy. What little simple optimism, simple engaging with your employees, you know, making making little games or making it fun at the workplace or finding ways to make things lighthearted, right? So that everybody enjoys their life and everybody enjoys their, their day totally can go a long way. Not only in the attitudes of others, but obviously monetarily for us as a society. You know, there are things that we're missing out on, opportunities that we're missing out on, money that we're missing out on, because we just don't care. And that is ridiculous to me. I think attitude is everything. Optimistic leaders can definitely be motivational and encouraging um, to their employees. I know many, many of you possibly work in an office setting. I know this is something that they've been working on and implementing in office settings for quite some time now. They do little games, you know, they have um, things called spliffs where they work for money and they, you know, it's, it's all about getting people interacting with each other, getting people to have fun and keeping an optimistic perspective at the workplace. And I think it's awesome. There was a few other tips here that I just wanted to get into. Um, when looking into this research and that and it kind of goes into another topic that i discussed before and it just really goes with starting your day each day right on time and right on target like forget the snooze button just get up out of bed right away and how you start your morning morning can definitely set your tone for the day um entrepreneur tim ferris who has asked hundreds of ultra successful people about their morning rituals. He, he says something like, if you're winning the morning, then you're winning the day. I love that, I love that saying. And what's really interesting is I was reading an article about self-made uh, billionaire Richard Branson. And he was discussing basically his morning routine or his whole day, what he does through his whole day. But he wakes up at five o'clock in the morning every single day. He exercises, then he spends time with his family. He actually works through lunch, 
Um, he check, he catches up with his emails, you know, gets into the news, reads blogs that are interesting to him. Like I said, he works through lunch, drinking tea um, to keep himself energized. And then he'll finish up with dinner with the family, and then he's in bed by 11. And that's his schedule every single day, 5 a.m. to 11 p.m. And he gets, I'm sure, as we know, quite a lot done during those days. And I think um, reading something like that, what it definitely, you know, helped me realize is personalizing your schedule will go a long way. Possibly making yourself a schedule for each day. I'm going to wake up this time. This is what I want to do. This is what I want to accomplish, X, Y, Z. And personalizing your schedule for your own, your own interests, your own your own tastes, I think could definitely go a long way. Um, <clears throat> and I definitely would have to say, stay productive, stay busy, remain optimistic. Nothing, nothing, nothing is better than an upbeat attitude, especially when you're at work, especially when you're around people every single day, right? So that's awesome. We're gonna move over to um, our universe, touching up on a topic, a very, very interesting topic here, um, relating to this gold rush that should be going on in space. I'm not sure if you've heard about this. It's getting a little, little crazy out there. Um, but governments believe that it's our future, that space, Mars specifically is what I'm hearing about a lot, is our future. Um, NASA has a project that may put astronauts on asteroids in under a decade and on Mars in the year 2030 or in the 2030s. Um, and yes, the costs may seem high, which definitely that they are, um, but it's kind of the way that they're perceiving it, of course. People are scared. People are scared for our safety here on Earth. And they're saying that, yes, the costs are high, the numbers are crazy, but we have to do what we have to do to protect our fates. They don't want us ending up like the dinosaurs. So there's a lot of other things going on here. I was reading um, Luxembourg in Europe, which is a European country smaller than Rhode Island. Um, its government launched a $227 million fund earlier this year to invest in space mining companies that set up operations within the country's borders. And they're going to be sending a strong message that the country intends to play a meaningful role in the changing nature of space travel. More and more, we're getting people going out into space. We're getting more and more people going out into Mars. I know I know. it was recent that I was hearing about um, they were going to be sending the first group of astronauts to be like living in Mars full time. This was last year, I believe I heard about that. Um, I know that in early 2016, the first DSI's exploration satellites, smaller than toasters, while hitchhike, um, into, they will hitchhike into space on rockets carrying other payloads and start scouting for suitable rocks. They are going to start farming in Mars. They want to see exactly what kind of resource we can find there and exactly what, what you know, type of life can be um, inhabited there. <clears throat> and some scientists have called for an infrared space telescope to track asteroids that could threaten the Earth and to develop a plan to deflect them. They're really worried about all of the traffic that's been going on, and they think that more and more... Um, more and more research needs to be done, more and more money needs to be put into this topic because considering that the Earth's resources are finite, um, what scientists, of course, believe, um, then the, <laughs> the survival of us as a human race is also very, in a sense, finite. It's, it's, it's a little scary when we really, really put it into those terms and we consider the fact that maybe we won't be able to live on this planet um, forever. But all this considered, we'd love to know what it is that you think, what it is that you think we should be looking into. Is this gold rush in space um, a good idea? Should we be going out into, into space or farther down into other planets to see what else is going on? Should we plant more, um, or I guess, should we go there and plant resources and prepare farming crops for us to travel there later on in the future? These are the things that I'm reading. These are the things that I'm hearing about. And though it can be scary, it can also be rather, rather interesting. And it can 
also bring a different perspective to what it is that we we believe life to be. And I think it's awesome though, for the first time in a very, very, very long time, that we have more of an understanding about the universe around us and more of an understanding about what goes on outside of Earth. So if you're taking anything from these stories, I think that's what you should really, really focus on, is the amount of technology and information and knowledge that we have now at this point is awesome. So go with how it makes you feel. Don't get scared just yet. We're still here. We're still pushing. Thanks so much for staying with me here today, guys. You can find us on Believe.love, Believe, or I'm sorry, YouTube.com, Believe Loves You. For our Android users, BelieveAndroid.com. And for Apple, BelieveiTunes.com. I'm Vanessa. Thanks, and you have a great night.